This is where the FIFA World Cup final will soon be held, the Lusail Stadium in Qatar. In just four years, it went from this to this. It has 80,000 seats and cost more than $700 million to build. It's the biggest stadium in the Middle East, but it's more than that. Over a decade ago, Qatar had hoped that hosting a mega sporting event in stadiums like these would put it on the map. But today, stadiums like Lusail are a symbol of how a country can build grand infrastructure to further its own interests and how those ambitions can trap thousands. Migrant workers lost their lives in the construction of the stadiums. Forced to labor under extremely poor conditions. Migrants working on infrastructure projects have died or suffered abuse. The logical source of oil for Europe is the Middle East. Since the 1940s, when Qatar discovered huge reserves of oil and then gas, it's been one of the richest countries on Earth. 70% of the government's revenue comes from oil and gas exports. Thanks to all that wealth, Qatar has gone through a remarkable transformation. The capital, Doha, for instance, went from fishing town to world-class city in just a couple of decades, complete with extraordinary museums and fancy hotels. But in recent years, the world has been turning to renewable energy, making the oil and gas market Qatar relies on even less dependable. And in the Gulf, the country has seen regional tensions surge, most notably in 2017, when neighboring countries issued a blockade against Qatar, cutting off trade and travel. It cost the country hundreds of millions of dollars. So to diversify and protect its economy, Qatar has started leaning into another area that helped establish its status as a wealthy nation, sports. That repositioning is based on soft power. Qatar is trying to secure friends when in need, particularly powerful friends from the West, like the United States and the UK. And so the best way to do that is through these soft sectors like sports. In the last 18 years, Qatar has held more than 20 major sporting events, but nothing compares to the 2022 World Cup. The winner is Qatar. Qatar won the rights to host the World Cup in 2010. Today we celebrate, but tomorrow the work begins. It had made an unbeatable promise to FIFA. It would spend more money than any host had ever done before. $200 billion. And it delivered. Since then, Qatar has built up eight stadiums. It's built dozens of hotels and laid down miles of roads and metro lines to connect all that infrastructure. They've even completed a whole new city with golf courses, marinas, and a theme park. It can brag that it is the first Middle Eastern country that's ever hosted a mega sporting event. To be able to do that, you have a lot of partners, including FIFA itself and all the celebrity ambassadors who are vouching for Qatar having these incredible world-class stadiums, these glowing, glistening hotels. You can come to Doha and feel secure that you're experiencing a world that's business savvy, that's modern and advanced. While the spotlight was supposed to show Qatar as a shining example of development, it also exposed one of its darkest secrets. To power decades of development, Qatar has relied on a constant supply of temporary low-paid workers, mainly from South Asia and East Africa. Since the early 2000s, so many foreigners have come to work in Qatar, they now make up 80% of the total population. They build, clean, serve, and staff pretty much every industry. When we think about how migrant workers' recruitment journey commences, we think about workers who are in extremely low-wage uh, situations. So they are looking for a case where they can emigrate to allow them some upward socioeconomic mobility. And Qatar promises them that mobility. Typically, Qatari companies hire international recruitment agencies that find workers to send over. They promise these workers well-paying jobs in exchange for illegal recruitment fees up front. They also have the workers pay for medical tests, passports, flights, the visa, all to get the job contract. The workers often take out loans in their home countries to pay the agencies, incurring significant debt. It's a huge transnational cross-border operation 
which completely screws workers at the start of their journey. Workers often use their family savings to pay for a job in one of the richest countries per capita in the world. They arrive in Qatar often to find they're not getting the job and salary promised and can't do anything about it because they've now entered the country's kafala system. It's a uniquely restrictive immigration system that can take different forms in different industries. But they all have one crucial thing in common. Kafala legally ties the immigrant's immigration status to their employer, meaning an individual employer has to sponsor their worker, which gives them an inordinate amount of power over them. They can control when their employee's job ends or if they can change jobs. They can control if and when migrants leave the country, often by confiscating their passports. And they can also control the worker's ability to renew their residency and work permit. But beyond the restrictions on a migrant's freedom of movement, this system also traps them in a cycle of abuse. And that became evident when Qatar started preparing for the World Cup. To deliver on the infrastructure Qatar promised, it tapped into its migrant pipeline and recruited hundreds of thousands of new workers. When Qatar was awarded the World Cup in 2010, all of the people involved in the decision-making knew that the World Cup would be built based on the Kafala system. Thousands of migrants turned into construction workers to build stadiums like Lusail, which became the site for human rights abuses that ranged from verbal abuse to death. Several investigations into Qatar stadiums revealed that employers usually house workers in private camps far from city centers, where they are forced to live in overcrowded rooms and unsanitary conditions. And at work, their lives are put at risk. Migrant workers are often given the most dangerous jobs on the site and can be forced to work up to 14-hour days in Qatar's extreme heat. The day this photo of Lusail Stadium was taken, the high reached 114 degrees Fahrenheit. They have spent so many hours in the blistering sun. And after that, they are only permitted like a five minute break to eat and they eat standing and then go back. Whenever you're also up on a scaffolding, coming down for a bathroom break might get you in trouble with your boss. And so you end up drinking less water despite the need to have it to avoid heat exhaustion. The number of work-related migrant deaths surrounding stadiums remains unclear due to Qatar's lack of transparency. In fact, that's the case with the entire kafala system. But there have been some clues along the way. The death certificates Nepal has received with the bodies sent back from Qatar show that nearly 120 Nepali migrants have died on the job since 2008. The real number, though, is likely much higher. In 2019, a study examined the link between Nepali worker deaths and heat exposure and concluded heat stroke was a likely cause of cardiovascular deaths. That alone could raise the number of just Nepali migrant worker deaths to about 600. In addition to living and working in abusive conditions, many are also not getting paid for their work. Workers have repeatedly faced wage theft. So then the debt keeps jacking up because the debt still exists. And uh, in many cases, workers have still not been able to survive on a daily basis. This is one of the richest countries in the world. And yet they haven't been able to accelerate reforms and ensuring people have been paid on time. Some workers try to file complaints only to find there are few effective mechanisms in place. And speaking out comes with risk of retaliation, which has kept migrants isolated in the Kafala system with increasing debt and unable to access justice. After years of mounting pressure from human rights organizations and a formal complaint that reached the UN's International Labour Organization, in 2017, Qatar signed an agreement promising to align its laws and labor practices to international standards. In 2020, 10 years after construction for the World Cup began, Qatar implemented a minimum wage for workers and now allows them to terminate their employment contract. But the challenge with the minimum wage laws is enforcement. Employers started pushing back against the government. And so um, even though we haven't seen uh, amendments to the legislation, indeed, we're seeing a watering down of reforms. And for the migrants who have already been abused to the kafala system, this is all too late. Civil rights groups and football associations are now calling for a remedy fund to compensate the migrant workers financially. And some teams have taken a stand in the field and on social media. We have learned that the decision to host the World Cup in Qatar 
which resulted in the suffering and in the harm of countless of our fellow workers. Making this year's World Cup a particularly difficult one to watch. Millions of football fans will still tune in and cheer for their favorite teams. But after that final match is over and the trophy is awarded, stadiums like Lucille will continue to be a grim reminder that it all came at a human cost. Thank you.